So if any of you have given presentations before, the, you know that having twice as many slides as you have minutes is a bad idea? Yeah, this is going to be fun. All right, so uh, my name is Luke Smith. I'm one of the core developers on YUI team. And we're going to be talking about inheritance patterns. And we're running a little bit late, so it's going to go fast. Hopefully, I won't be speaking too quickly to melt any brains. Let's go. So by way of introduction, here we are again, browser wars. Uh, it's a lot of old news again. It's different now than it was before. Uh, we have you know, new, new browsers that are better. Old browsers in the old days, they sucked. The hardware was terrible. Now we have more devices. And uh, it's generally hard to be a developer. That's not new. Um, <clears throat> but the context of, uh, of what makes it hard today is, um, is definitely different than it used to be. But one thing that hasn't changed from the old days to now, and even the time in between that, is time. It, it continues to be rare that we are given enough time as developers to build out our applications in such a way that um, we are meeting all of the requirements of accessibility, uh, internationalization, and really future-proofing the code that we're writing so that it, it um, ends up not costing us time over the life of the application in the maintenance cycle. And so time does break down into that, that basic uh, division here between the time spent up front building the thing and then the time spent over the life of the application that you're sinking into feature enhancements, bug fixing, and um, my god, I can't believe I wrote that code. So um, the development time is really where you put in the investment to reduce the maintenance time. And development time breaks down into two basic sweeping generalized uh, categories of prototyping and structuring. And prototyping is where you just get the thing working, right? If you've uh, done any hack days, that's all it is, right? But <clears throat> you are hating your future you if you stop with prototyping and push to production. You have to put your code into some sort of structure. And creating those relationships between the uh, objects in your system, properly modeling the objects in your system, and organizing them in such a way that um, uh, over the life of the application, if something comes up, you know where to look. Or things are isolated well enough and combined in such a way that uh, it's, more, it's trivial to update and maintain over the life of the application. So structuring is where the investment really happens. And so that's obviously what this talk is about. So let's get into it. So YUI comes with a lot of stuff for creating uh, infrastructure out of the box and getting just sort of that, that rough framework for you to put your application in. We have, you know, we have the CSS, we have the modules and loading, and the custom events for doing uh, more decoupled relationships between objects. But we have to build classes uh, on top of those things and uh, working with other objects on top of those things. And there are a lot of different ways that we can create the relationships between those objects, the types of patterns that we can fit those relationships into. So I have a lot of different uh, strategies to cover. And I'm going to start with the two native styles of uh, inheritance relationships and then go on to the artificial relationships that we build into the library. So we have methods for dealing with the, uh, or for making it more convenient to, to use the native inheritance styles. And then when we start getting into the artificial structures, that's when, uh, in my opinion, you get a lot of payoff for your maintenance going in, into the future. So starting with native <coughs> and pseudo classical. So this is old school. Everybody has done this, right? I mean, there can't be anybody in the room that hasn't written this. Uh, back in the day, creating a, a, a superclass to subclass relationship by just assigning the prototype of the subclass with an instance of the superclass, right? Now, if you've done this before, you should probably know why this is bad. But we've had the extend method in the library since the first versions of YUI2. Um, you see this pattern used in libraries everywhere. And outside of libraries, uh, there's uh, a lot of versions of an extend method. And this one is ours. So if you just take this one line and replace it with y.extend, it's already better. And we'll go over why it's already better in just a second. But the extend method adds that extra sugar of saying, OK, we know that you're planning on 
creating a relationship between one class and another class. So we'll add in some additional arguments to allow you to define the class as well. So the third, uh, third parameter to extend, for example, is where you can add in your prototype properties. There's a subtle difference between doing this and doing uh, individual prototype assignment or just saying subclass.prototype equals some object literal, right? Um, and then a lot of people don't actually know that there is a fourth argument to extend, which takes the static properties that you want to decorate uh, your subclass as static methods or static properties. This actually comes in handy largely when we start extending the infrastructure pieces in the, in the library like base or widget, right? Um, but then there's one other little trick with extend, which is that it, it returns the subclass that you pass in. So you don't have to define the subclass first and then call extend. You can actually use extend as a class definition method if you want. So just passing in the constructor function as the first argument to extend, and it'll return that. So then you capture the return value of extend, and, and boom, you have your subclass with your constructor, with your, extends, uh, your extension relationship, your instance, uh, instance members, your prototype, and your static properties, OK? So um, we're going through extend kind of quickly because everybody's used basic extend. It is um, it's the meat and potatoes of, uh, of class relationship, subclass, superclass relationship in JavaScript. It is using uh, prototypes, and it's, uh, so it preserve, preserves instance of, and it's very bare bones, and it's fast, right? So um, extends also adds that static superclass property so that you have access to overridden methods if you need. And um, we'll talk about why the control of the superclass constructor execution is actually a benefit when we start talking about some of the other techniques. So, um, you know, the cons for extend are really relative to the other methods uh, of creating relationships. Uh, for example, there's no multiple inheritance it, because uh, inheritance goes through the prototype chain, and the prototype chain is linear. It, it does not fork. So um, the constructor chaining is, while you have control of when and where it happens, uh, it is kind of awkward to do. So it, it tends to look like this, right? And, and I'm sure everyone here has memorized this and, and typed this out. I mean, you can prattle it off by memory. No, because it's kind of awkward, right? It's this really long and idiomatic, right? And if the subclass that you're, that you're or I'm sorry, if the superclass that you are creating a subclass of doesn't actually represent um, a set of functionality that's going to be used heavily by the subclass or by the instances, if the instances aren't going to be called with the superclass methods directly, then you know maybe the, the subclass relationship, superclass relationship isn't the right relationship for that. So you might actually be incurring a cost for calling the superclass constructor if you're not going to be using those methods. So we'll talk about uh, different methods to avoid constructor chaining uh, in the superclass or establishing different relationships for your subclass, superclass, and um, other uh, types of features. Yeah, yeah. So to sum up, it's good for the basics, right? But if you can use y.base, and I will mention this again, use y.base, because there are a lot more options for you. It brings in so much more to the table um, in terms of not only feature set for the classes that you have, but also for the structure that you can establish on top of those classes, or to even assemble those classes. So now let's take a side jaunt through prototypal inheritance. I have probably more slides in here than I should, but uh, this is a bit of an aside, and we're going to take this aside by route through the extend method itself. So there's, uh, from time to time, we get questions about why YUI doesn't use prototypal inheritance instead it uses pseudo-classical inheritance? And the answer is, well, we kind of do. But uh, for most modern applications, most uh, web applications, pseudo-classical uh, pseudo, uh, pseudo inheritance makes more sense. And we'll actually show you an example of why. But inside of extend, here you can see we're calling the y.object method. And the y.object method is 
the method for establishing a prototype relationship, so doing prototypal inheritance, it all goes through y dot object. You don't have a lot of options there. That's where it comes from. And this is it. That's the method. If you are on a browser that is uh, ES5 compliant, it has the object.create method. It's even smaller than that, actually. It just calls object.create. But in, in essence, it does just this. It, it, it actually is less complicated than what it looks like here. There's a little magic with the anonymous uh, function wrapper and the private uh, function f there. You can think about the, the, the white out object method being just these two lines here, where you're setting the prototype and then you're returning a new instance of f. And so how that works in comparison with uh, the new superclass method of old, if we had a superclass that we wanted to assign into the prototype slot for this subclass, calling the constructor is bad. We just want to establish an inheritance relationship between these two classes. We don't need an instance to represent anything. We just want to have all of the methods on the prototype of my subclass and have that um, instance of relationship established between those two classes. It, calling the constructor is actually a cost. And also, you might have to pass something to the, to the constructor in order for it to do something. It might just break if you don't pass arguments to the, to the superclass constructor. But what are you going to put, right? I mean, it, you're just trying to establish a relationship. So um, what y.object does in this, if we walk through it, is uh, since the constructor is what's creating that cost, we avoid it by taking the prototype object and copying it over into this uh, empty uh, function here, and then creating an instance of that. And since the constructor for this is empty, it doesn't do anything, there's no cost. But because this prototype here was the same object as that prototype here, when we create an instance of this, we do maintain that instance of relationship. But there's still a cost here, though. And that is the superclass constructor is not called when you create an instance of subclass. It's not uh, called automatically. Ergo, the need to uh, manually call the superclass constructor to chain those constructors and that big, long, awkward thingamajig. But if you want to just do pure prototypal inheritance, then just using y.object, you don't have to be working with a prototype of some other class. You can just be working with any old object. And you pass it into the prototype there, and boom, you create an instance that has all of the properties of that object through its prototype relationship. So um, you don't have to copy over individual properties. They, you just get them for free. Plus, if you modify that object, then those show up for everything that uh, inherits through the prototype for, um, through the prototypal inheritance for all instances that uh, are begat from whiteout object. Um, <clears throat> but in practice, it doesn't have an awful lot of use because the, the fact that the properties of this object aren't own properties of the instance, they live on the prototype, means that you can't enumerate over them, for example. If you want to do an enumeration with has own property, all of those properties on the prototype are going to return false. Right? So that actually can get in the way in terms of common patterns of code use where you're just going to be iterating over the properties of an object. Uh, one method, uh, one pattern that is useful for using y.object and the prototypal relationship is the factory constructor pattern, which if you follow along what's going on here, um, here I'm, I'm defining a class set. And instead of working with the this object, I'm going to be working with a that object. And I assign the that object dynamically based on what this is inside of the function. And uh, so I'll show you an example of why this matters. So if I call new set, then inside of my constructor, the this object is going to be an instance of set. And so instance of set true, right? But oops, I forgot new. That means that the this object inside of the set constructor is going to be the global object. We really don't want to be modifying the global object in our constructor. So using y.object, we'll do what we did for the extend relationship. Do you remember the extend relationship? We took a y.object of the prototype of the superclass. And basically what that does is it creates an uninitialized version, an uninitialized instance of that superclass. In this case, we're going to create an uninitialized instance of the very class that we're inside of, 
And incidentally, we're in the constructor, so we're going to then continue on with initializing it. So as long as we remember to return the that object instead of the this object, then we're all good. And what comes out the other side will also be an instance of set. So that's one way that you can um, maybe cover your, cover your butt a little bit of, or give your users the opportunity to fail uh, but not have it uh, result in a code failure. So using the factory constructor, the YUI uh, class itself is actually uh, does this as well. So that's why you say YUI parent parent. That's effectively saying new YUI parent parent. OK, so enough time in um, prototypal inheritance. So the, the relative pros and cons are, uh, like I said, it avoids copying the properties. Um, the, because you have, this relation, you have all of these properties uh, hanging out in the prototype, that means if you assign a property to that object, it can shadow one of those properties in the prototype. But if you then delete the property, it hasn't deleted it from the prototype. So you can create a sort of, here's my, uh, my original values. I'm going to create an instance uh, derived from that, and then I'm going to update it. But then I can revert to the original values by simply deleting those properties and letting the prototype uh, property shine through. Um, you can use the factory constructors if you want. And um, in practice, the, the avoiding class explosion, you know, maybe it, it I haven't seen it be the perfect fit for that myself. But um, there, the cons are a short list, but they are fairly significant, right? The, you don't get the multiple inheritance, which is because it's going through the prototype chain. And uh, the factory constructor you know, is, uh, is nice, but it is effectively dead code if people are using new like they should be, right? So you're, you're adding code to protect against the improper use of your code. Um, and then the has own property gets in the way really quick, let me tell you. I've done some uh, prototypal inheritance uh, based code. And the fact that I can't do a has own property anymore, it just feels sort of exposed and uncomfortable. And it's so easy for me to just automatically type that has own property in there that I'll just add a bug by just mechanical, uh, mechanical typing. Um, so it doesn't really fit in with a lot of the problems uh, in web development um, today. And what I found, at least in, in uh, patterns that I've seen for use of prototypal inheritance, is that this tends to emerge. So we'll take this prototype object and we'll beget a few instances of it. But whenever we beget instances of it, we're always going to be updating prototypes. Uh, I'm sorry. We're always going to be updating those instances to differentiate them from the prototype itself. But when you're differentiating it from the prototype itself, you're usually doing it in the same way, which is, a constructor. So here we are again, back in the prototypal uh, um, pseudo-classical inheritance pattern. And now let's move on. OK, so that was the, the native method. So now let's get into the fun stuff, which is uh, when we start artificially uh, creating artificial relationships between stuff that, that we um, will throw instance of under the bus. Instance of, I don't care about instance of. So. Um, the first of which is going to be augmentation. So augmentation is our first approach for, or um, the first approach that I'm talking about now, for creating a multiple inheritance relationship. And uh, the key API in, in question is y.augment. And you can see y.augment being used in a few places in the library if you course through the code, which I recommend, incidentally. Um, in particular, model list is an example here, where we have the, the uh, model list being defined, its constructor, but you can see that it's actually extending base. So its extension hierarchy is already, is, is already taken. So we can't extend array list also. We have already extended base. So instead, what we'll do is we'll augment array list. And what this does is it takes the model list class as it exists right now as a base class 
uh, a base subclass, rather. So you can see here we have a constructor for uh, model list, which is chaining into the constructor for base. We have some base methods, and we have some model list methods in the prototype. And then what the augment does is instead of just mixing the methods directly onto the prototype and then creating some relationship to the, uh, to the constructor, which I wouldn't know how you could do that really easily anyway um, in pure JavaScript. Instead, what we're doing is we're defining these sort of placeholders of these activation functions on the prototype, which map to the names of the, of the APIs on the prototype of the augmenting class. So when we create an instance of model list, we're only calling the constructor for model list, which then chains to base, and boom, we have an instance. And the instance inherits the prototype, which has these activation methods, right? Now, if we call each on this instance, it's going to then fall over to the uh, prototype's uh, implementation of each, which is then going to send this activation signal through the augment infrastructure to, say, to do three things. The first thing it does is it copies over the individual properties, or the individual methods, rather, from the ArrayList prototype directly onto the instance. And then it calls the constructor, so now we have uh, the instance here uh, has gone through the appropriate setup to make it work as an array list. It has the properties, or it has the, the methods, and it has gone through initialization. And then finally, we call that method again on the instance, which now is uh, the version of the method from the array list prototype. It's kind of complicated and, and convoluted. Um, and it only gives you limited control of, uh, well, here, let's go through this fancy animation one more time. Yeah, yeah. So when we called the constructor here, how did we know what we were calling it with? Because we created an instance of model list earlier, and we were passing arguments into that, into that constructor. But the array list constructor was called automatically for us. So we didn't get input into what we could pass into that constructor. Augment does support uh, limited configuration into what you can pass in with the fifth argument. I'm not going to actually talk about the third and fourth because they're, in practice, they're not very useful. But the last argument to augment is the, the uh, arguments that you would pass into the constructor of your augmenting class. So um, it's good that you have some control into what goes into that constructor. It's less than excellent that you only get to define it once. There's no instance level control. So that goes into the pros and cons. Um, so it, if, you're, if you're with me here, the, the augment interaction and setting up the relationship between one class and the augmenting class is kind of complicated. Uh, it's a little intricate. And the, the challenging part really is establishing the relationship of a class that already has some extensions or that already extends from a, a superclass. How and when do you trigger the superclass um, super constructor? And what Augment aims to do is it, uh, it targets um, a situation where the class that you're adding the behavior onto your class with, right? So you have you have multiple inheritance, so this class behaviors are maybe less useful and maybe aren't going to be called very much, but they might have some setup cost for them. Going through the constructor, there's going to be some setup cost for them. So you don't want to incur that cost on all of your instances unless you have some signal from the implementation that they are going to be used. So it defers the constructor of the augmenting class. So it's a special kind of lazy multiple inheritance, basically. Um, and because it is multiple inheritance, that is a pro, right? So we're now we're, we are able to do multiple inheritance. You give up instance of, and you've given up the, the static link to the superclass, because now we're relating to multiple classes. But this is also low level, like y.extend is low level, that you can just do this with any function that you want to. Augment uh, handles this at a lower level. Uh, the cons for Augment are also uh, perhaps pretty obvious, actually. The, the, the first call to one of those augmenting methods is costly. 
the call to the constructor is basically a wash, right? You're either going to do that in your subclass constructor, chain to that, chain to the augmenting classes constructor, or when it gets triggered by the that uh, augmented method to call the constructor and then call again to that method. That's basically a wash for doing the, the call to the constructor. The cost is that we are creating uh, copies of the functions. We're, we're copying all of the individual functions from that augmenting class onto each instance. And that's going to consume memory and it consumes time. So you have to ask yourself really is the, the, the value of the deferred constructor worth the potential cost in memory and uh, the, uh, the initial hit that you'll take with that first call to uh, one of the augmenting methods. Also, because we get into multiple inheritance, we have to worry about the diamond problem, where you have the subclass inherits from multiple superclasses, and those superclasses inherit from a common superclass themselves. And so you end up going through a superclass hierarchy and then duplicating some uh, grandfather constructor logic, which really, which often messes things up. Um, <clears throat> okay, so to sum up, you can you can use augment, or you can just use this sort of pattern here, which doesn't defer the superclass constructor. It just uh, inlines it into the constructor of the of the subclass, just like it does with the superclass, and then. For the prototype that you define for your subclass, you just create a, you create your uh, prototype as it is, and then mix in the prototype of the additional augmenting class. So in this case, the prototype contains direct links to the prototype methods uh, automatically. There's no copying of, of instance methods or copying of class methods over to instances. Everything exists in the prototype. You are taking the hit in the uh, the constructor for that uh, for the the other class uh, in your subclass constructor. So, if that's fine, then this will likely end up being a faster multiple inheritance strategy for um, uh, in. in as opposed to using augment. So use augment if deferral of that uh, constructor is really important. Now let's get into uh, two of the really fun things, which are plugins and class extensions. Yeah. So plugins, now we start to get into really flexible, uh, flexible structures here. Plugins are, um, I guess I'm, I'm uh, forecasting a bit, but Plugins, you can think about being instance-based. Class extensions, you can think about being class-based. So the plugins, the operative method in plugins is the plug method. Um, and the plug method is something that is on the host. The plugins themselves have very, very few requirements. And we'll talk about that in a second. But so if we walk through what happens here, then we have uh, the overlay class, which is a base-derived class, which means it has plug. Uh, the, in order to plug something in, the class that you're plugging it into needs to either extend or be augmented with or just have the APIs for y.plugin.host. Uh, and base gets that for free. Also, nodes get that for free, too. So you can plug in nodes, which is pretty awesome. Um, so we'll create an instance of overlay. And now we have these, these attributes on this instance of overlay here. And now we, we introduce this plugin drag class, which exists in the library. And when you call plug, what it does is it calls the constructor. And it creates an instance uh, where it, uh, it's passing in the overlay instance as part of the configuration passed into the constructor. But really, this is just an instance of a class. Right. So we, ha we basically have two objects at this point. Two objects that each have their own respective set of attributes, that each have their own respective prototypes. And it just happens to be that the instance of this plugin is coded in such a way that it takes that host uh, configuration and it wires itself in to that host to listen to its behaviors, to listen to its events, and maybe um, 
add, add some advice through AOP methods, uh, why dot do dot before, do after, and some other uh, sugar methods that actually are available on why dot plugin dot base. Um, and then it takes the namespace that is configured on that plugin, and it just assigns a new property on the instance of overlay here called DD that points directly to this instance. Right? So we're basically, at the end of the day, we've created two objects, and then we've assigned one object to the property of another. Um, <clears throat> so that means that uh, overlay.dd is a separate object that just knows about overlay, and it works with overlay. It's kind of wired into it. But it, it does maintain its own stuff. So if you need to set one of its properties, then you need to, then instead of setting a property on overlay, you're going to be setting a property on that other instance, right? So the, the, uh, the, the drag instance, the drag plugin instance. But when you, I love the flames. So when you unplug, though, um, <coughs> the relationships and anything, any wiring that went into this class into that class go away. And that's part of the contract for plugins that we'll talk about in just a second. The requirements for plugins are that. That's it. The host has to have the functionality of y.plugin.host, as I mentioned. And the plugin class, all it needs is a static NS property. It can do anything it wants as long as there is a static NS property on that function, it'll work as a plugin. Ask later, man. Okay. Right. Um, so, the, so the plug method, as you can see here on, uh, on plugin host, basically boils down to this conditional here. If the plugin is there and it has an NS, then create a new instance of that plugin and assign it to that namespace. Everything that happens inside of that constructor it's up to you. And uh, at the end of the day, we end up with the DD instance here, or the drag plugin instance here, and then uh, with its own set of APIs, and then you can unplug it. You can actually unplug it by namespace as well. But the contract is uh, where we start to get into the, the relative pros and cons of plugins, in my opinion. And that is, plugins should expect to be working with a host object, right? Otherwise, they're just sort of vestigial functionality that doesn't care about where it's hosted. So it being a plugin, it should really care about its host. That's not too much to ask, I would, I would say. Um, they can provide their own APIs. They could just be a plugin that you add to a host, and it just modifies the behavior of the host. It doesn't add its own API at all. But you can provide your own API. Um, and uh, you can modify, you can either provide your own stuff or you can modify the, the host. But the two things that it must do and it must not do, it has to remove all traces when it's unplugged. So you can't permanently alter the host object. You have to make sure that everything you do to the host can be undone cleanly. And so you can't modify the, the host directly. You have to provide your API as uh, on your own instance, on the plugin instance itself, which means that that API is namespaced. So don't modify the host object. Just listen to its events, listen to its methods using AOP advice uh, uh, methods. So um, Some people don't know that you can actually plug a class. And what this does is it um, makes it so that when you create an instance of overlay, it is automatically then plugged with uh, whatever you passed in to the, uh, it's automatically plugged in with the drag plugin because I've plugged in the class with uh, plugin.drag. So you can think about this actually in, uh, as similar to the DOM. So you have an element is going to have a style property. The style property has its own API. It has its own properties and that is not duplicated on the element itself. This is um, auxiliary functionality that is related to this element, but it is not part of the core behavior of that element, right? So this is additional functionality. And that's, that's the distinction for uh, going inheritance versus going plugins or extensions. Well, mostly going plugins, but um, 
you have core behavior established through the prototype and through extends. And then you have additional behavior through plugins. So um, let's get into the pros and cons. Um, if you start mixing in a bunch of classes into the same host class or into the same subclass, then you can run into naming conflicts pretty quickly, especially if you're going to be using common verbs for taking actions. Um, and so having things namespaced helps prevent that naming collision. Um, the ability to, to plug uh, classes or instances is pretty nice because there's, uh, it adds a high degree of flexibility. The very few number of requirements that it takes to be a plugin adds a lot of flexibility. The fact that you can work with nodes adds a tremendous amount of flexibility uh, because you can use node plugins to be like mini widgets. Or if you don't need to do a lot of complex state management, you just want to enhance a node, then you could just write a node plugin that does all of that, right? And maybe over time, you might want to evolve that into a widget. But even if you do that, you can evolve that code into a widget and then keep a node plugin that just creates an instance of that widget plugged into that node, right? So um, it affords you the ability from node plugins affords you the ability to code from an an instance related to a node or from a node that uh, is augmented with this behavior. So it, it allows you to code in, in either direction, whichever your preference. Um, <clears throat> so the cons for using plugins, and cons are always relative, right? The fragments the API, you know, maybe you think that this function is kind of core or it's just kind of a nuisance to be having to set attributes on a namespace thing. It's just confusing to, uh, I just want to set the attribute on my overlay. I don't want to set the attribute on some property of my overlay. It just, it ends up looking odd in the code or maybe that just feels awkward to you. Maybe it actually feels right. Totally a stylistic choice. Um, <clears throat> but there is an opportunity for confusion there for future developers that are then maintaining your code. So that's why I listed in cons, but again, it's, it's relative. The, the, the plugin contract to, um, to be non-invasive on the host, that can be a little costly. And, um, and it also means that if you have multiple plugins, then they can start stepping on each other's toes, and you have to balance out which plugin comes first. And if I have a plugin that actually requires another plugin to be on there as well, then uh, the, those relationships can start getting a little complicated. Uh, and finally, plug. This is a temporary problem, but um, I think we're going to make plug a little sugary or a little easier to use than passing in the class that, you're, that you intend to plug in. Um, so yeah, plugins are terribly flexible. They tend to be better in small numbers, at least in my opinion. And um, they, when you ask yourself if you want to use plugins or augmentation or um, multiple inheritance via just mixing into the prototype and chaining the, all of the superclass constructors, it becomes a question of um, do you want to use augment to defer the constructor? Is this behavior more appropriate to uh, would, the, would the behavior be more likely to be expected directly on the instance? Um, and some other notes that I can't remember to now. But it, it, the choosing plugins versus augmentation largely boils down to uh, personal preference. Do you want to be adding onto the API of this class, or do you want to be segmenting this functionality? Um, <coughs> for both plugins and augmentation, having the, the auxiliary code live in its own module or live in its own class has value for maintenance going down the road. So again, we're breaking into, we're, we're talking about the, the breaking up one monolithic set of functionality into a series of more discrete bits of functionality and then creating the relationships there. Um, so now we get into class extensions, which in my opinion, are awesome. So let's get into that. Uh, class extensions do require base. Uh, we're going to look at the, the two methods that are used 
with class extensions by way of um, comparing it to the extend method. So in a typical case where you're extending base, you, your constructor function does nothing but pass, uh, pass off to the base.constructor. And we saw enough of this in the library when we were doing this uh, in creating our own classes that we just said, let's get rid of that. We need a name for, uh, to satisfy the contract for base, uh, for base, but we're just going to be chaining the superclass, so let's get rid of that awkward superclass chaining. And then we'll add in this additional argument here, which is where the magic happens. And with that, we have y.base.create. So y.base.create, you will see all over the place in the library. We love this method. And actually, we love this method because we haven't uh, uh, made another method that might be a little sexier. But it does what we need to do. And it, uh, and yeah, so we'll, we'll take a look at an example of a class generated with uh, base.create. Here, uh, the charts packages there are a lot of individual classes in the charts package that take heavy advantage of the class extensions. Here we have the line series, which is extending Cartesian series. And Cartesian series is an extension of base. So here we have, in effect, an abstract class called Cartesian series. And we're going to satisfy the contract of that abstract class by mixing in y.lines, this common functionality, y.lines, and then gluing the y.lines code into the Cartesian series code. And the y.lines code is actually useful in other subclasses of Cartesian series as well. And it might actually be useful outside of the Cartesian series family in other classes as well. But you can see here, we'll just add this behavior and this behavior and these sets of behaviors, and then we'll glue them together. But since we have some common APIs and some common functionality, it makes logical sense for, main, uh, for maintainability to take that code and put it somewhere and then incorporate that code. We don't have to do it using a build step. We can do it using the APIs uh, in when you're defining your class. So let's take a look at the, the process of defining line series and what it actually does, what base.create does. So base.create is going to create the sort of a shell of a uh, shell of a class. And its constructor is composed of the chaining of all of its, of its constructor and all of its class extensions constructors. So if I had lines, I had fills, I had anything else in here, this constructor is going to be a call to the Cartesian constructor followed by lines constructor, fills constructor, all of those. So it goes through all those constructors. In practice, class extensions tend not to have any logic in their constructor. Prior to 3.4.1, they would because we didn't support initializer chaining. In 3.4.1, as of 3.4.1, if you have an initializer defined on your class extension, it will get chained in, which is really handy because, you, uh, the, because initializer executes after all of the attributes are set up. Speaking of attributes, if we, uh, so the next step is that it takes the attributes from Cartesian and um, any attributes that you've specified in y.base as that fourth argument, or fifth argument, fifth argument, I think, um, in the ATTRS collection in there, and then all of the class extensions, and it just mixes them together into one object, because this is a static collection of attributes. Now, it does some, some friendly stuff in here in that it takes the, the Cartesian, and then here, since we actually had a type defined in both Cartesian and in here, it's just going to mix them together. It combines, those, uh, combines the configuration for those attributes. So you're not just clobbering that one with this one. It's not last one in wins. It's you can, contribu you can contribute more and more to the, uh, to the attribute with other extensions. This can bite you, but in practice, it's actually been uh, more handy than harmful to us. It's kind of a push, right? And finally, we get into the prototypes, which it does. Um, <clears throat> we get into the prototypes, which it does a similar thing of mixing in the individual prototypes, uh, starting by creating a subclass of, or I'm sorry, creating an instance of Cartesian. So we have that prototype relationship to its superclass. So officially, it is still an instance of Cartesian, right? But 
all of the, the class extensions are then mixed into the prototype directly. So like, um, like that alternate solution for augment where we're just composing the prototype using all of the methods instead of doing the lazy uh, method linking, all of the instances of line series are going to benefit by having uh, all of its methods exist already on its prototype. Now, there, there's the special affordance then given to initializer and also to destructor that if you define them in the class extensions, then the prototype version of this base.created class is going to uh, chain all of those initializers together. So um, <clears throat> when you create an instance of the line series, the three things that it does at construction time, or that it chains the constructors, it sets up the attributes, and then it calls the initializers in order. So it calls the initializers starting with the line series, const uh, line series initializer followed by y.lines initializer followed by all of the other class extensions initializers. Um, class extensions basically break down into two categories. There the decoration and core functionality. And they're used for different purposes, basically. Uh, class decoration would be the core functionality of this particular class is already well defined. Instead of going with a plugin model, I would like this APIs, these APIs and these attributes to exist on class instances directly. So I'm choosing to augment the prototype and augment the attribute collection directly for all instances of this class. Um, I prefer that uh, for things that aren't going to get too big uh, or that aren't going into systems that are needing a lot of plugins and a lot of features because it's easier to work with objects that have their own attributes and have their own methods. The other way uh, is uh, to fill in core functionality. And remember I was mentioning earlier about the Cartesian series being basically an abstract class. And that's where this comes in. So we're going to satisfy the abstract class implementation. And the reason that core functionality is terribly useful, that having class extensions for core functionality is terribly useful, is because it promotes flexibility for an environment-driven implementation. So YUI has conditional loading of modules, for example. You can create a class that is composed of a, a base abstract class followed by a number of uh, class extensions. And one of those class extensions could be the implementation specific details of what it means to run in a Node.js environment. Or I'm going to be delivering this out to a mobile environment. Um, and so I want to have maybe some, some lighter weight stuff going in there. And so I can use the dynamic loading to say, in this case, in this environment, I'm going to satisfy the abstract class with this particular implementation. In the other case, I'm going to satisfy it with this other implementation. So in the end of the day, you have the abstract class, and you have smaller bits of environment-specific code that are appropriate for you to be maintaining, because you know that um, I have to change something for this class in this environment. So you can segment it out per environment that way. Um, this is overlay. We like to show off overlay because this is all of overlay. And we just think that's really cool. But this is, uh, so I, I'm actually curious what your response would be. But we are running a little bit low on time. But uh, this is actually an implementation of all decorators. All of these class extensions are generically useful to any widget. And there was actually some discussion about whether or not we should bother creating an overlay class, because they can just, people can just create their own instance of, uh, of whatever overlay-like class they want that's composed of whichever pieces of this functionality they want, which is still true. You can still do that uh, by, I think, panel um, and tooltip and other examples that'll just use a couple of those bits of functionality. So these are all features. These are all decoration. This isn't core functionality to overlay. Core functionality and overlay is just widget. But contrast that with slider. And here we'll actually, I failed to mention the other, the other method for working with class extensions. 
Um, slider here, we have a slider base, which is an abstract class, which we satisfy with that y dot slider value range implementation for adding the value attribute and for tying the movement of the thumb to updating the value attribute, right? Um, <clears throat> but it would be awkward to have to have that functionality live on a namespace, like in a plugin, right? So it, it defines the class. Uh, but then y.base.mix is the method that we can then say, here's some additional behavior, and today I'm going to add this to my class. And this actually modifies y.slider, and it adds the behavior onto the prototype, and it configures the, uh, it updates the constructor and the construction logic to now include the, um, the clickable rail constructor into the constructor chaining and the initializer into the initializer chaining. It mixes in the attributes and all that. So basically, we are dynamically changing and enhancing this slider class uh, at, uh, at runtime which you can get into um, all sorts of fun when you have packaged up features and um, you know, adding them into a class and making it more feature rich, I guess. So the extension pros and cons. Um, I went over this already, but it, it, it strongly encourages the segmentation of code into implementation specific stuff. Uh, and in particular, it's well suited for dynamically reacting to environments. Um, if you prefer the APIs live on that class for features, then it's a good option. Otherwise, for doing the abstract class pattern, um, this is you would want to be using um, class extensions for that. And because of the nature of the class extensions being aggregated onto that class, it allows you to emulate other patterns for assembling your class together. So if you want to emulate an MVC breakdown in the logic for your widget, for example, you can have the class extension that does the model stuff. You can have a class extension that does the view stuff, a class extension that does the controller stuff, and then they are mixed in, uh, or they're based out created onto a class, which then you instantiate it, and it has all of the logic and the APIs are there in one object, that you use that one object instead of working with three disparate objects. Um, <clears throat> and the cons, it's saying it requires y.base as a con um, bothers me, but I really like y.base. Um, so there is some initialization overhead because it is going through all of the chaining of the constructors, uh, con uh, the chaining of the initializers. and. Uh, you can't do this to instances like you can do with plugins. And it doesn't work on nodes um, and other things that we talked about with augment that you're going to run into naming collision. So the, I think the big takeaway really from, from the session should be look at extensions and plugins, play around with them, see what feels best for you, your particular style. If you want to use uh, class-based plugins so that all instances have this additional feature set, but that feature set exists in a namespace like it does in uh, patterning after the DOM or so. Um, in particular, look at class extensions for doing, um, for doing class composition for segmenting out, uh, segmenting out reusable bits of code. And um, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's largely it, I think. Um, so then MVC, since we are out of time and since Eric is doing a talk on MVC tomorrow, I am going to forego all of my slides and say go see Eric's talk because he knows more about it because he wrote it. Right. So. Wait. Use base. Right. And uh, if you don't know about the IRC channel, we're in there all the time. Great community in there. And all right.